Hello, my name's Joel Dunning, and uh, we are delighted to be joined here uh, by the wonderful Alexis Shafi. So we had uh, Todd Rosengart uh, a few weeks ago uh, talking about some of the most incredible achievements at the Texas Heart Institute and Baylor College of Medicine. And he said there was literally nothing bigger than this incredible achievement uh, that you have done. Alexis, you're, you're actually surgical director of the Heart Transplantation Center there at Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center and associate professor. Uh, at Baylor College of Medicine uh, and you're very amazingly have implanted the very first bivacore total artificial heart and this has been absolutely not even just years in the making but generations all the way from Bud Fraser who who dreamed uh, of this moment so maybe uh, you could tell us a little bit about this incredible achievement and the backgrounds to this big moment sure absolutely um it was in um July of last year that we, we put the first in human, but we've been working on a lot of the preclinical work uh, in the animal lab uh, downstairs for the FDA to allow us to do this in the humans. But preceding this in, in really 2011, Dr. Cohen, Billy Cohen, uh, did a, a biventricular HeartMate 2 uh, case, which was the first uh, continuous flow device to provide total heart replacement. And, and that was really the proof of concept uh, that began this, this journey uh, to having a continuous flow total artificial heart. You know, obviously the history of, of the total artificial heart goes back even further uh, here with, with Dr. Cooley and, and Dr. DeBakey. Uh, but uh, but this, is, uh, this is an amazing pump. Uh, it has essentially zero wear points, profound impact as far as durability is concerned. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, tell us about the most amazing things about it. I mean, it's tiny. Um, it's still got a single moving part. Uh, it's, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, tell us about some of these technological breakthroughs that, that obviously make you guys feel that this really will be a technology breakthrough. I, I brought one here. Here's the pump. It's essentially the size wow. of the pump. It's got a impeller that essentially uh, pumps for both the right and left side. So essentially it's a single disc uh, which is spinning in a magnetic field, levitated in with the ma magnetic field and uh, is pumping for both the right and left sides. It also balances the difference in flow between the light, right and left sides. There's a slight uh, difference in the amount of, of blood flow between the right and left sides and it has an internal uh, shunt that allows washing and to uh, allow that balance of the of the pump. It's it's got similar connections, uh, quick connections like the Syncardia uh, uses. Um, so essentially, atrial cuffs uh, and then the uh, alphographs with the quick connections. The amazing thing about the pump, though is that it actually can simulate a pulse by ramping up and ramping down the speeds. And essentially we can create with this pump a palpable pulse in the radial. We can detect pulse oximetry on the finger. We can uh, use a, an automated blood pressure cuff with accuracy. Uh, which is quite impressive uh, with the uh, sophistication of the ramping up and ramping down of the of the pump speeds. And that's absolutely fantastic. So, um, so your first patient was last year. Maybe tell us a little bit about uh, how they got on, and and I know there was plans for more. So, how 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 has it gone with the implantation of this uh, device? Our patient was a fifty seven year old male. He was biventricular heart failure. We were waiting for a heart for some time. It was a larger blood type O patient, uh, male. You know, he failed a balloon pump, ended up upgrading him to an impella, was failing the impella. Renal uh, function was starting to uh, decline and we were not able to find a heart for this man. So uh, we had uh, him enrolled as the, as the first subject for the Bivacor. We implanted the pump, uh, the pump, uh, operation it was smooth just as though we had you know uh, done in our animals uh, so we were familiar with the with the actual implant and um, you know the patient did well he was supported for nine days and, and a heart was found for the man and he and he did well and, post -transplant. 
And have you done further cases since then? I think the FDA have approved you to do further cases, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah we did. They permitted us to do was five cases. We had five cases done in four centers. The first was here at Texas Heart. Uh, Duke did one. Christ Hospital in, C in Cincinnati did one. And Banner uh, in Arizona did one as well. Uh, and then we did the the, fit, the last of the first five uh, that was in November. And that patient also very similarly, biventricular heart failure, failing temporary support, unable to uh, uh, find a heart for the man. And he was also supported uh, for five day, uh, five or six days. And then we transplanted him uh, once we found a heart. There's also been four uh, cases, so uh, nine in total that have been done in humans. Uh, the four additional have been done in, in Australia, two in uh, Sydney, two in uh, Melbourne. And, uh, and so the longest patient supported on the device was in, in, in the Sydney, the first case in Australia and Sydney. He was supported for 104 days until he was successfully transplanted. Wow, that's absolutely amazing. And just technical from surgeon to surgeon, is it technically difficult to put in? Uh, you know, is this a big deal, a very difficult operation to learn? How is it? No, I think I think if you've done the Syncardia, it's very similar as far as the suture technique and the explant of the uh, of the recipient heart. I think just understanding how to explant uh, the heart is probably the you know most important part. But I sew the cuffs just like uh, I do a valve. I just put a bunch of interrupted stitches in and trim the cuff to the appropriate dimension and just you know parachute it in and i i, I use core knots uh lately and it, it seems to work nice you get a nice tight snug uh, uh suture line yeah. and then coming when you come to do the transplant to explant this device again is that is that relatively straightforward it doesn't cause you too many trouble to remove this no that's a very important point uh, dr Araby is in uh arizona has talked a lot about uh, you know, setting yourself up for for the explant when you do the transplant, and he's he's uh, you know described that very well with with a lot of the syncardias. So essentially, you wrap the the pericardium with a Gore-Tex membrane. You put a silicone uh, tissue expander in the pericardial space to preserve uh, the space itself. So if if the pump stay in for a long period of time, that that pericardium will contract and around the pump. And, and for a very fibrous pericardium. And essentially there's uh, potentially not enough space for the donor heart when you are to explant it. So a tissue expander uh, was used to, to preserve that space. It, it wasn't relevant in our cases because they were only in for nine and five days. So, but we did put them in uh, with the anticipation we may have to leave the patients on support longer. Uh, phlebotomy tapes are used around the the uh, aorta and the uh, pulmonary trunk uh, to help, you know, uh, you know, that keep that uh, plane open for the for the explant. Yeah, fantastic. So, so I guess uh, I'm sure there's very ambitious uh, thoughts for the future. So, but but where where are we going next uh, with this amazing device? So these first five were done they all these patients were not able to be discharged okay uh because we the the, the company had not they were still kind of uh, teasing out the, the 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 details with the peripherals as far as being able to discharge patients so now they have peripherals that are capable of patients going home with this device the fda just permitted 15 more patients to be in, enrolled in the trial with the ability to, for those patients to go home with the new peripherals. So essentially, the first five were all stayed in house until they were able to be transplanted. We're going to have patients, uh, and they're all still going to be bridged to transplant 15 more uh, cases. And that's going to be in, uh, we've got, it was four centers to begin with. Now we've got two more centers entering, and the goal is going to have, be uh, 10 centers total in that next 15 cases. Fantastic. And uh, so obviously proof of concept to get them out before bridge to transplant. And then and then how far do you think we are until until potentially uh, we allow it for, as a destination therapy? Do you think it's still quite far away, really? Well, they're already talking to the FDA about the, the next uh, after the 15. This is part of the feasibility trial, this next 15. As far as the next phase uh, for 
uh, FDA approval, they still want this to be a bridge to transplant trial. And so as far as moving to destination, I think that's going to be something similar as we saw with um, with HeartMate 2, where it was first and hardware, where it was first bridge to transplant approved and then moving to a, a destination uh, you know, study. But yes, I do. I mean, I think that is potentially the uh, special thing about this device is, it, you know, the durability of this device and lack of wearing parts, it, it, it is promising as a total uh, heart replacement therapy uh, for patients who, you know, one, are, are not candidates for heart transplant or don't want heart, heart transplants. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's very promising. But as far as when... I, I've asked, you know, maybe five years we'll see we'll see it FDA approved, hopefully. Well, I guess that's the nirvana, isn't it? That's that's what we're all hoping for. And so, so I guess uh, finally, you know, where do you think we'll be in five, ten years? Do you think we will have full destination mechanical therapy? Do you think it'll be bivacor? Do you think any other devices are candidates for that first uh, total artificial heart? You know, finally, where where do you think we'll be in five, ten years? I think Bivacor is the one that's most, uh, the farthest along with the most promise. I, I think it is going to change the field. We have so many patients we put LVADs in that really struggle with right ventricular dysfunction. And so I, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see this device uh, coming into clinical use and, and hopefully making it easier for us to take care of patients. Because when we do these LVADs and, and the patient's you know, have this right ventricular dysfunction, they really struggle, uh, makes it hard on the patients and, and the hospitalizations and re, as far as rehospitalizations and end organ uh, dysfunction. This pump pumps 11 liters per minute. The other very interesting uh, thing about this pump is it, it reacts to uh, physiologic demands. If you look at the pump flows and you do a six minute walk test, the, the fluctuation in the flow will increase by two liters. So essentially with exercise, as more blood returns to the heart, there's increase in forward output from the pump, which is quite amazing. Wow, that is absolutely fantastic. Well, thank you so much for, for jumping on this call and for your incredible pioneering work. Um, I'm sure we're going to be hearing a lot uh, from you and everybody uh, there at Baylor. It sounds like a truly incredible unit that's doing so many unique things and uh, it sounds like an amazing place to work and live. Yeah, it's, it's, a good, it's a good place to work and it's a great group of teams that are working on this uh, that are contributing to this as well. It's, it's a multi-center uh, trial and, and effort uh, by a lot of uh, uh, very experienced surgeons and it's been good to be involved with it. Great. Well, well thank, thank you for having right. me.